what I'm going to talk about is what turned into my book project, which turned into a book uh, published by uh, the University of Georgia Press. And it started out as, as my dissertation project. Um, I was not always a history professor. This is a second career <coughs> for me. So I started a bit late. I was uh, 40 years old when I started my PhD program. So uh, there's always a second chance. Uh, that's the way I looked at it. Um, so why did I pick the Natchez? I wanted to get a group that hadn't been worked on very much before. And the most recent project I was able to find, uh, um, none of them actually were exclusively on the Natchez Indians. And most of the uh, projects um, focused on the late, uh, or the uh, late 19th century after Native Americans had been removed to uh, Indian country. And by the way, just, just uh, to uh, let you know, the um, term Indian uh, is, is, is politically correct. It's used in Indian country. Uh, if I spent a lot of time in Oklahoma where I got my PhD and uh, Indians call themselves Indians, uh, it's no longer um, just Native Americans, American Indian. So there are a lot of different uh, uh, thoughts about that, but uh, when I say Indian, I'm talking about the Native Americans, and that's the term that they often use to refer to themselves. Um, so the Natchez. Uh, the Natchez were uh, uh, a chiefdom. Uh, we tend to use the word tribe in, in, in uh, modern parlance, and uh, Native Americans today will call themselves tribal members. There are tribal roles. And in the 20th century, 21st century, that's perfectly normal. Um, it doesn't really work for people who look at the 18th century and further back, because tribe implies a, uh, a uh, common ancestor. And the whole thing about the Natchez is they don't have common ancestry. They, uh, are quite, uh, they were quite aware at the time that there were people from all over the southeast who moved into Natchez country, um, both uh, Europeans, Africans, and Native Americans who weren't Natchez, who didn't speak the Natchez language, um, and who had come from quite a distance to live among the Natchez. Um, so what is a chiefdom? Well, obviously you have to have a chief to have a chiefdom. Um, but these were hereditary chiefdoms. A lot of chiefdoms today um, are uh, men and women acquire or are elected chief. Uh, one of the most famous chiefs I had the pleasure to meet was Wilma Mankiller. She was the first uh, primary chief, uh, female primary chief of the Cherokee people. Um, the Natchez had a pretty interesting um, system of uh, inheritance, and, and it gets very complex. In fact, anthropologists still haven't quite figured it out. I have my guess on it, but um, what it, what it uh, entailed was uh, that political power was inherited through the women, that they were matrilineal. Um, it was the sisters of the chief, the, the nephews, so to speak, of the primary chief, uh, who's in, among the Natchez was called the great son. So mothers are really important in this story. Um, in fact, what I found were there were quite a few very tough mothers in, in, in this story, um, women who played some significant roles and acted as peacemakers. And um, unfortunately, eventually they failed. Uh, there was a very terrible war in 1729 that um, pretty much ended the Natchez as a autonomous power. So the Natchez are a, a chiefdom, and chiefdom is made up of villages, towns, uh, and the Natchez, uh, at the center of their towns, had plazas, and they built mounds. They were a mound-building society, and in fact, uh, they were the last mound-building society that um, the Europeans encountered. De Soto encountered mound-building cultures in the 
uh, 1500s, and then there's this long blank period between about uh, 1540, 1560, all the way to 1680, uh, 1681, when the South encountered the Natchez. And um, they were extremely powerful. Uh, they were able to put a thousand men in the field at any given time, which made them pretty much the most uh, powerful military society in the region. The Choctaws were uh, the number one uh, group, but they were further to the east. But the whole thing, as I began to uh, look at the, at, the, at the Natchez, I could see that they, they um, broke up, they coalesced these chiefdoms. Uh, one one uh, ethno-historian characterizes them as uh, the flashing lights on a Christmas tree. They would coalesce, stick together for a generation or two, and then break up into smaller villages, and then re-coalesce. And I heard a really interesting anthropologist say, if you really want to understand these, these chiefdoms, read Shakespeare's history plays. Read Macbeth. Um, why? They're small kingdoms, about 60 miles, 70 miles uh, across, which is about the distance that a man can run from the center of the chiefdom, about 30 miles, in a day. So read Macbeth. Macbeth is about her uh, inheritance, who's going to take the throne of Scotland. There's, we're always intrigues about who was going to take over for uh, a hereditary chief in one of these complex chiefdoms. The um, Natchez were no different. So they were used to breaking up and absorbing outsiders. And part of what I argue is that when the French show up, especially La Salle, we think of La Salle as you know, wearing a uh, very elaborate 17th century coat and wigs and hats. And when he went and spoke in front of the king, I'm sure he did. But when he went down the Mississippi, most of the people who were with him were Native Americans. They were Abenaki Indians from Maine and Mohawks from uh, upstate New York and from the St. Lawrence Valley. Um, the majority of people who came with him were uh, Indians, and there were women and children with him. And that sort of gets written out of the story. And what I'm trying to do, or what I tried to do in this book, is write, write these women back into the story. So. The um, Natchez, of course, they live a pretty much, uh, let me see if I can get the, will this act as a pointer? Okay. Well, I think we can, I'll come out with the microphone. Can, can we see? And you can see Natchez right here. It's up by the, uh, along the Mississippi River. Uh, DJ just told me that he was, his family's from Natchez, Mississippi, and I said, uh, we might be talking about his ancestors. It's very, very possible, uh, indeed, that uh, the Natchez um, took in all sorts of groups. And the first uh, Europeans who show up are pretty much a mess. They're lost, they don't know where they are, they need food, they need protection, and this is what uh, a, a, a complex chiefdom specializes in. Takes outsiders in, gives them some um, protection, redistributes food, uh, they have elaborate ceremonies. Um, the uh, slide that I had just shown was actually a funeral. Uh, one of the things that the Natchez did was they uh, had human sacrifice. While the, the women were very tough, they often accompanied their husbands into the land of the spirits. When the husband died, so did the uh, wife. Also worked the other way. When uh, a, an important woman died, her husband accompanied her into the land of the spirits. So, yeah. Um. That's a good question, but yeah, they were to act as servants. They were to act as uh, they were to act as um, uh, they were still mates. They were still, yeah. 
And that's a really interesting question because one of the qu when I started reading the French documents, and I kept reading the French documents and reading the French documents, first the ones that were translated, and then I learned to read French, and then I was actually able to go to Aix-en-Provence and to Paris. It was very tough work, but somebody had to do it. And I, I was able to go to the, um, the archives and read the originals. And what I began to see is, are the Indians telling the French what they want to hear? Because almost everybody who was writing down their stories were actually um, Catholic priests. And in fact, there's some evidence that the last great son of mine, you sure? Did they turn it off? No? Technical difficulties. You can all hear me though, right? This is for the I don't know that you need it. Should have been a rock star, right? Um, so the Natchez, um, who's who's writing their their um, their their stories? Well, the Natchez didn't read and write until uh, the the descendants don't learn to read and write until the 19th century. So we get all of these stories second hand, sometimes third hand, sometimes fourth hand, and a lot of times the stories are coming again through women, through uh, Native American and French women. Um, so, the, uh, they're filtered, and I all, uh, what, what, what anthropologists will call it is ventriloquism. They put words in the mouths of the Indians to get their point across, especially if you're a, a Catholic priest and you're, you know, you're, you, you're, you're, um, your street credit, so to speak, comes from uh, converting a lot of people. So if you convert a lot of Indians, um, then you're doing okay. Well, the first, the first uh, missionary didn't do so well, and in fact, he might have been the father of the last great son, because women or men, if they were high-status people, they married what they called commoners. Um, they married down. They were uh, what we might call a morganic marriage. They, uh, they married the underlings. My argument is, is this is how they brought outsiders into the, into the polity, into the group. You, uh, a important person would marry an outsider, um, and then that outsider would become part of the, the kinship network. And they would be, you married into the woman's family, unlike Western society where women marry into the men's family until very recently. So, um, and since almost all of the outsiders when it comes to the Europeans are men, very few women until the 1720s, it's always the men marrying into the Natchez families. So um, we have a lot of different Natchez uh, uh, who, women who are quote unquote in love with French men. And it only makes sense also because of con constant warfare there was a shortage of Natchez husbands. So it, it, it only makes sense. Then we come to the French. So who are the French? Well, what I found out was they're not all French either. There's a, uh, uh, there's a good chunk of Germans. Um, there are plenty, uh, there are a few Czechs. Um, even an Irishman or two, God forbid, um, that uh, moved into Natchez country. And the, um, so what I tried to do is put myself in the, in, the, in the mindset of the Natchez. What are they seeing? They're seeing people who come. They are outsiders. They're not doing so well. They, they wind up starving quite a bit. Quite a few of them starve in the first years uh, of the 1720s because the French government hadn't planned for uh, this huge influx of people that they pushed into French Louisiana. So they, the, I argue that the, uh, f the Natchez look at the, the, the French as, or the Europeans as multilingual, just like the Natchez were, um, that they were a bit disorganized, 
just like the outsiders, the refugees, the Native American refugees who come into Natchez country, and that they see that women, the few women that are there, are very important. You know, that uh, in some cases you have something like a five or six to one male to female ratio. So the women really get the pick of who they get to marry. Uh, they can marry the wealthiest men, and the women are almost like magnets for property. The men go out, work in the fields, catch yellow fever, keel over, the women remarry, and this property accumulates uh, with, the, with the women, uh, the French women, the few French women that there are. So, well, as I was reading the, the various French um, documents, I began to see that these Indians are also calling themselves red men. Now, ethno-historians, historians have recognized that it's really the Indians who come up with that term, red man, or uh, uh, in, in French it's uh, homme rouge, red man, or red man. Um, so, why did they come up with this? Well, there is somebody named Nancy Shoemaker who wrote a great article uh, about 20 years ago, said how the, Indians, uh, how the Indians got to be red. And she talked about the Natchez. Now, I came across this article early, early on, forgot about it, and then about three or four years into my project, I began to see, oh my goodness, somebody beat me to the punch. I remembered, oh, Nancy Shoemaker, and when I started sending articles out for peer review, they said, well, Nancy Shoemaker said the same thing. What are you saying that's different? So I had to come up with something different. When you write a dissertation, it should be new territory. It should be territory that people haven't, haven't seen before. So the angle I started looking at, when I started looking at the maps in the archives, I started saying, my goodness, this is a, a very small place. We're talking about an area where the Natchez live that's maybe, maybe five miles by 10 miles tops. And the, the concentrated area uh, would be two or three miles by two or three miles. So think about from where we stand to M59 and then over to uh, maybe uh, Oakland University. So you're looking at a very small area, and concentrated villages would all fit easily within the Oakland University campus. It's about 1,400 acres, uh, two golf courses. Um, so think of maybe three or 4,000 people living in this small area. How do they get along? I mean, one of the things I saw when I walked in was that they have Plains Indians, a picture of Plains Indians on the advertisement for this uh, uh, talk, and these were not Plains Indians. They were, they stayed put. They built mounds. They were urban, as about as urban as, I would say, maybe as urban as we are in, in Rochester in terms of the concentration of population per square mile. So how, did, how do I find out? How, did, how could I get to the way this worked? How could I get to the way that these Indians organize their society, and then deal with the influx of about 300, 400 Europeans and about the same number of African Americans. Or African, they were African Louisianans. They were from Africa. Some might have come from what's today Haiti or Martinique. So you have eight or 900 newcomers showing up with all of the things that colonists like to bring, especially horses and cattle, things that are really unusual and very destructive. And I found out that space had everything to do with this. So, <coughs> you know, here's a close-up of Natchez today, and you can see uh, Martin Luther King Drive and uh, where the... Uh, Highway 84 bridge crosses the Mississippi. So, and there's Natchez National Historical Park, and that's what's left of Natchez country today. Um, it's a very nice state park, and um, some of the mounds that the Natchez built are still there. 
during the 19th century, those mounds were really attractive for people who were building uh, cotton plantations. And some of the mounds are no longer, some mounds are no longer uh, exist simply because they were literally bulldozed for the rich soil that had been piled up over the centuries by Native Americans. Some of them were blown up, um, and some of them have highways built over them. Um, Natchez is one of the few places that was relatively undisturbed. So um, I'll give you some better images in a second. I can see you're craning your neck, and that's OK, because I was, I was doing the same thing. How do I express this? And then I discovered, um, I discovered LIDAR. And I discovered, uh, I went to a, a workshop in Florida. And I learned about geographic information systems. And geographic information systems, basically uh, a way to map data onto uh, a visual or two-dimensional surface. Now it's gotten very sophisticated. A lot of gaming software is being used, so you can actually do fly-throughs. I haven't gotten that sophisticated. But what I had to find was a map that would that I could begin to work with a, a 21st century map. And, and that's what I have here. You can see this map with the, um, um, let me grab the microphone. The uh, lighter area is actually a LIDAR uh, laser or a, a light imaging system. It's done either through an airplane or through satellite. Now, the resolution of these maps, very, very high. When I was able to blow this up, I could see the curbs on the street. That's how, that's how uh, fine the resolution is. The other neat thing that this does, this particular type of LIDAR, is it strips away the vegetation, and it's stripped away the buildings. So this is just to give you a frame of reference of what I was working with. So, I had to find certain features to start my project. And those are the two mounds. You can see these dots, very faint, right here and right here. Those are the mounds built by the Natchez. You can see them. Question, I'm sure. Sorry, I don't know what a mound is. Is that a burial, or is that for living in? They built that mud, but I'm sorry, I don't know what a mound is. There it is. Good question. You anticipated the next slide. It's actually a mound of dirt. And um, some of these mounds, the Monk's Mound in, in um, Mississippi, or excuse me, in, um, where is it? It's in Illinois, 11 stories high. This is only nine feet high. So, but it was both. It was both, they were both used for, for, for burials, and they were used for homes. One of the mounds, um, I don't know if I can go back. Let's see if I can go back. Yeah. One of the mounds, this mound was a, a home. This was a, a foundation for the great son's cabin. And so th on top of that was a, a hut made of uh, mud and thatch. And the other mound, which you can barely see, a lot of it had been washed away. There were other mounds that had been washed away by this creek. This is a St. Catherine's Creek. Um, that was a temple mound, and people were buried in that. And in fact, in the 1930s, they excavated that mound and found the skeletons. They know who the skeletons belong to, that the last great son, we have very good records, that he was buried in such and such a place on that mound. The mound's not that big, and the skeletons match the, the um, historical records. So um, the mounds functioned as a couple different things. They were, I think, the Trump Towers of the, uh, of the, of the, night of the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century. These were places, hey, look at us. We're so good. We're so smart. We're so uh, amazing. We can build all of these mounds. Um, and you want to come to us because we can protect you. We can. We can help you. We can give you all of the uh, um, food that you need. Uh, you just have to pay attention to us and treat us as we're in charge. So that's the mound today. 
It's been eroded a little bit. It's not that big, maybe nine feet tall. Um, and that's, that's the mound that the uh, great son lived on. So he had a house on top of that. Um, this is the other map that I worked with. And again, you're not going to be able to see it that well. It's, um, it's about 12 sheets with that little bit uh, down in the, uh, I guess, in the lower left-hand corner from where you are that uh, were, were drafted. This is actually a tax map drawn in 1723 by an engineer named Ignace Brutin. Brutin was, um, he was always angling for a good job from the government. So he wanted to show them how, oh, but I, pardon me, how valuable he was and what can be more valuable to a government than, than showing this is how you can collect taxes. And he must have, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty, pretty certain that what he did was he took a, several slaves and they took a chain um, attached to two on either end to poles and measured out the entire area. And again, this map is about six feet by three feet, so it's a huge map. And I was able to get a, um, I was able to get a, uh, a digital copy of it. So now I have the LIDAR copy and the digital copy. And I was able to use the mounds, I needed man-made positions, to um, rubber sheet. So imagine stretching a rubber sheet, a map that's made, uh, printed on a rubber sheet, and stretching it to the LIDAR. And that's what I was able to do. And you can see there's some distortion there. Some of it's from the computer, some of it's from <coughs> you know, the inaccuracies that were in the maps themselves. So the next thing, oh, I went a little too far ahead. So I was able to find a couple key positions. Then I was able to use that map that Bruton had made. He listed every home, whether it belonged to a French person, a Czech, um, a German. So you have people named like Jean Schultz, John, uh, Johann Schultz. Um, you had Czechs, and, um, and uh, there were even a, a few Italians, and uh, an Irishman or two. So he listed the location of every French home, and I was able to plot them on that map. I was also able to make sure I was pretty much in, the, in, in ballpark because we know where the fort, Fort Rosalie, which was the main French trading post and fort, I could figure out where that was too. And it's up near that cluster towards the center of the map. That's where most of the Frenchmen lived. That was also where the warehouse was, where the Indians would come to trade. So you're looking at a pretty small area, and you're going to see how small it was. Those red dots are where the Indians lived because Bhutan also wanted people to see where the Indians lived. This is one of the few places where Indians were actually selling land retail. We, 1723, sorry about that, 1723. This is one of the few places, when we think about Indian land sales, it's usually between the government and a tribe. This was between individual Indians and individual Frenchmen which some French really didn't like. They didn't like the French government had no control over what lands were being transferred, how, what, the, what the title was on that land, whether there was the Indians, when they sold it a lot of times, they knew what they were doing. They knew they were selling it. And they knew, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, they didn't understand land sales. These are very cagey people. These are not dumb people. They know what the French are about. They've been dealing with the French for 50 years by this point. So, you can see where the Indians' homes are, and that, that cluster down in the, uh, in the uh, lower uh, left-hand part of the map, that, that's the Grand Village. That's where the, the mounds were. That's where the, um, where the action was if you were an Indian. So you can see that it's, it's a fairly dispersed area or settlements. You've got that, that sort of center of the map um, that I would call the inner commons. And I'll explain why space was so important. And I was able to take the trails and the roads, the dark line 
are uh, cart tracks or cart uh, a road that um, could, you could uh, take a ox cart, they lead to two big concessions or plantations. The French in the 1720s looked at Louisiana. This is how we're going to pay off our, our national debt. The French were deeply in debt. Um, uh, we look at our national debt and say, oh my goodness, isn't this a uh, huge national debt? Nothing compared to what the, the French were dealing with in the 1720s. And uh, they never really figured out how to run their financial system. It took a revolution to untangle all of the uh, financial problems that the, the French were having. So they looked at this area as a place to grow tobacco. And they were going to corner the French tobacco market. And this is, or the 17, from 1700 to about 1730, the French really start to, to take the tobacco. They used to chew it a lot, but they get to a point where they're using it for snuff, and then they begin to smoke it. And if you go to Paris, I mean, I spent a lot of time in Paris, and if the French do one thing, they smoke. They all smoke. And they, they find the place that, that says, no smoking, and that's where they light up. So it's, it's very French. So... These big tobacco concessions, you can see them there. They're in that yellow area there. Now, those big yellow areas are, are places that are under cultivation by the Europeans. So what does this matter to the Indians? Who's actually working in the fields? African slaves and Native American slaves. So you're, this is in your face. Native American youth are being uh, men and women, it was uh, men and women, women were more for domestic and sexual uh, use, for lack of a better term. Uh, the men worked in the fields, although the women also worked in the fields. So you can see those big clusters of yellow. Those are concessions that the French government, they actually ran the um, the colony of Louisiana through the Company of the Indies. The French Company of the Indies uh, was a sort of semi-public institution. The king did not want to get himself involved with all the expenses of running the uh, colony, so what he did was he basically leased it to a private corporation that was going to run it, that entire colony of Louisiana, all the way up to Canada and all the way west to the uh, Rocky Mountains to the east to the Appalachian Mountains. That's what the French claimed. So this was sort of a, a privatization of colonies. This was a standard uh, way of doing things, by the way, at the time. The British did it. The English did it. South Carolina was a proprietary colony. New Jersey uh, was a proprietary colony. Pennsylvania stayed a proprietary colony all the way until 1776. So they're basically private corporations running these colonies. So you can imagine that there's conflict of interest going on here. The French want to grow lots of tobacco. So they begin to encroach on the Natchez. And the other thing was, well, what do the Natchez see about slavery? And you can see those big green dots. Those are places where I knew that there were Indian slaves. So if you notice, if you're trying to go to the main area, that big knot of um, farm that has an Indian slave, at least one Indian slave, maybe more. Can you imagine what's going through in Natchez's mind? When's my turn? When am I going to be in chains? And indeed, they start to say that in their speeches and their talks. So how do I know who had slaves? How do I know what color the slaves were? This is a census for, from 1726, and I was able to match the census to the map and then plot it using the computer to plot it on an actual um, grid or an actual uh, land surface. So you can see, um, you can't see very well here, uh, but you get the idea with the columns. Each column first who owned the, uh, the, pl uh, the farmstead or plantation, how, how many women and children, white women and children there were, and then how many slaves there were, whether they were uh, black males, black females, 
children, Indian males, or Indian females. So it's, we've got a, a pretty good estimation, well, it's not an estimation, it's person for person, of who lived where and what they did. So I was able to plot it again. But as you can see here, this is not the easiest thing to read. Uh, it's great for me, because I know what all those little dots mean, but what about my readers? Um, and then what am I going to do with these other French maps? These are really nice. They give me bits of information. Um, where do I fit this all in? Here's another sort of schematic. This was more to, to get people from France to come. But each one of these maps holds information that I could use. This one especially. Um, the, this map has um, one of the groups that um, I was really interested in. Um, one of the outside groups, you might not be able to see it here, Village de la Palm. Uh, this is the Apple Village. These were Native American immigrants to the area. These are newcomers. And where do they move? Right in between the French settlements on the river and one of the plantations. They're smack in the middle. So again, you got this great map. This is good until you start to make sense of it. This is what I was able to do when I blew it up. This is a lot more readable. And you can see um, the round circles, the concentration of, um, of, of French homes. You can see St. Catherine's Concession up in the upper left-hand corner, Terre Blanche, or the uh, White Earth Concession down at the lower right hand. And then you can see the Grand Village of the Natchez and um, the roads and the paths. And for instance, you see La Page du Pot. La Page du Pot was a Dutchman who was a, uh, one of our best informers on what was going on in Natchez country. And he has at least one Native American slave, which, who he had a baby with, uh, he had his daughter was um, born. She stayed a slave, though. She stayed. He did not free her. Um, and um, looking from their point of view, from the Indian point of view, this was a way to gain access to French goods, to muskets, to cloth, to uh, steel knives and hatchets that don't snap, no matter how thick the buffalo hides were to axes that you can chop down trees within 15 minutes. It took an Indian maybe three or four days to bring a big tree down. All of a sudden, you can bring it down in 15 minutes and start on your, your dugout canoe. But here's, the, uh, here's another thing that I saw. I started looking at this in a different way. And you can see where the Indians are starting to, in, they're starting to encroach on French settlement. So you have two expanding groups. Now, to make it a little more interesting, the French start passing laws called the Code Noir. The Code Noir of 1724, the Black Code, the Black Code was designed to control slaves. And it was rewritten uh, specifically for Louisiana by the French government. But the local colonial governments started adding to that code noir. And what they started adding to, the way they started adding to it, was to include Indians. So it, the, the, the terms were no, no, no black, and then they used the term nigra, or no African, or Indian can carry a stick bigger than his thumb. No Indian, an Indian must get off the path when a Frenchman comes by. No Indian can inherit property. Now, if Native American or women are marrying Frenchmen, the Frenchman dies, the property goes back to the company. It doesn't go to her as a widow. And this was traditional French law up until the, the colonists decide to change it. A widow inherited her husband's goods, just like it is with us now. It wasn't always that way with English common law. Only a third was reserved to the widow, and the rest was taken by creditors. 
all of a sudden, Native Americans find themselves disinherited and moving increasingly into a subcategory of second-class citizens or third-class citizens. Um, slaves weren't citizens at all. So this is where I start to argue, and you can see how close these people are living together, that there's no way a Natchez could trade with a Frenchman, could sell corn to a Frenchman without seeing the way slaves were treated, the blacks, they use the, 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 the term noir or negra, both uh, talk about skin color, or blanc, the whites, they called themselves whites, the French were aware that not everyone was French, so they stopped using the term Francais and start using blanc. Whites, blacks, this is where the Indians come up with the term red. That they're the red men, that they're not second class citizens, they're on the same level. And they start telling stories, especially the French missionaries, about how the Great Spirit created the white man, the red man, and the black man. And the white man had all of these good technologies. The black man was overbaked in the oven so of, of, of creation, and he lost his way, and that's why he's enslaved by the whites. And then the red man, who is made from the land, is made from the red earth, the clays uh, along the Mississippi River. And they are the most spiritual. They belong there. So they use this, they look at the way that the French are beginning to divide themselves up legally in racial categories. And they're in such, what I argue is in their such close proximity, they're, they're cheek to jowl, that there's no way they can't see this developing racial category. If you look at the old French laws from the 1600s, they don't use those terms. They're Francais or Christian, Christians. They don't use the term white. They don't use the term uh, they use the term esclave, slave. They don't use the term black. But by the 1700s, they start to use those terms because just Francais no longer works. Not everyone's French, particularly here. It's the sujet de, de roi, the uh, subjects of the king, or whites. The Natchez were used to have multicultural, multi-ethnic societies. They call themselves the red men. That's the way they pull themselves together. So that's, that's the argument that comes across in the book. Now, once the uh, things go really bad after 1725, the great son is, um, he dies. He's buried in this elaborate ceremony. His wives are buried with him. Not just his wives, but his spokesperson, his, his, his uh, um, I guess what you would call his speechwriter. Um, uh, one of the great medicine people, uh, a woman named the Glorious One, she goes into the grave with him. So we have all these graves, and we know where they are, and we were able to dig them up. Oh, not we, I wasn't there. But, um, and then the French recall one of the great rogues of all time, a man named Bienville. He was a Canadian, but, and he was a slippery character. Uh, I could tell you all sorts of stories about him. He gets called back to France to face charges of corruption. But he could deal with the Indians. He could speak Indian languages. He spoke as up to five Native American languages. So he was a great, you have the master politicians, the master diplomats dying. You have an 18 year old who takes over, the young great son. He doesn't get the attention. I mean, can you imagine uh, people our age listening to an 18 year old who is now in charge? I don't think it would work. So uh, what winds up happening? A war breaks out. Uh, now, who tries to stop it? It's the women. It's the French women, but particularly the Native American women. The mother of the great son, uh, her name was the tattooed arm. She tries to talk him out of this war. And uh, he just says, it's too late, mom. You know, things are going bad. And uh, War breaks out in 1729. It's a disaster for the colony of Louisiana. Louisiana just loses all credibility in the French popular imagination. Anybody who's ever seen the, there's a great opera called uh, uh, Manon Lascaux, uh, and that's based on French Louisiana. And uh, there's a great, Chateaubriand wrote his great poems about the Natchez. Uh, in fact, one's called Les Natchez. Le Nache and uh, Atala, 
These are great epic poems. If you were in a French high school, you'd have to read them. So every Frenchman knows about this. So when I go to France and I say, you know, I study the Natchez, oh, the Natchez, you know, ça, ça soit, professor, sit down, come in and talk, you know, so um, the, the, that's where I base my book. And it's actually gotten some good press, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I just wanted to lay out the general framework here. And, and we have a few minutes for questions, so I wanted to know if anybody, if you have any questions. I know a uh, young lady up front was, she's very, uh, you have this sort of question, puzzled look. No, that's fine. That's what I get. I get paid. People like you are why I get paycheck. Okay. So, sure. How did who die? Um, the chief that died he, he, was, he was an old man. We're pretty sure he was an old man. Yeah, old age. Now, when he, uh, the, the Natchez were pretty spectacular when they had their funerals. The way that they, uh, they, uh, their wives were, in the case of a high status woman, their husbands went to the great beyond, was they were strangled. They were ritually strangled, and they were strangled by their relatives. It was a great honor to send your, your daughter or your mom or your, your cousin to serve the, the great son. Now, how much of this was packaged for European consumption? Now, we know that mound builders killed people uh, in ritual sacrifices. Up in Illinois, they've uncovered graves with as many as 50 young women. We know they're female skeletons. And they usually put women in, they say, their 50s or 60s, one or two of them, to keep an eye on the younger women. And we know that they were ritually sacrificed because um, we can tell by the way that their skulls were crushed or some of them, that their fingers are still curled up as if they were dying in agony. And so... These were very bloody sacrifices. So the French love to tell stories about this. This is, this is Quentin Tarantino on the banks of the Mississippi. I mean, they were, these, these stories made it into their version of, um, you know, of, of, of popular literature. Uh, there was one magazine called uh, La Mercure, which was aimed at women. And these stories are all in them. That, so, the, the French are getting this in pretty much real time. Within five or six months from the time it happened, it's on the streets of Paris, which is lightning fast. That's lightning fast for 1729. Um, the French struck back, and that's where my next book is going. But, um, uh, and um, I found some pretty interesting stories about the people who were involved with uh, destroying the Natchez. The Natchez, for all intents and purposes, were wiped out uh, as an autonomous group. Now, there are still some Natchez today, or people who claim to be Natchez, but when they speak Natchez, the Creeks or the Cherokees can understand them, so we're pretty sure that they're not, you know, that they were inter, you know, they intermarried with, with other, tri other tribes to such an extent that a lot of their culture is now lost, so. Yes, gentleman in the back. You said they, they were mountain builders. Mm -hmm. they, um, do you think they're a remnant of the older mountain building culture that was spread through Illinois, Michigan? Absolutely. Were they, were they the, the, the final um, aspect of that? The final, uh, were there any, you said there no other mountain builders after them. Bingo. You so, they, so they were the, the final? They're the last mound builders that we actually, um, that any European really had a lot of contact with. Europeans like De Soto, um, they came through these mound building cultures and there were a, a whole lot more. What destroyed them, they were on the decline by the time Europeans arrived. So this was not, you know, the, these are very fragile polities, you know. Again, think Macbeth, think um, King Lear. Uh, read Shakespeare's plays, you got a good handle on the, um, you know, the intrigue. So, the, the, but the short answer is yes, these are the last. Uh, are they directly related? Uh, 
they found Natchez pottery in Michigan. So, you know, it, they, they were trading uh, long distances. We don't think of that, but they've also found coral from the Pacific in Alabama. So we know that there was long distance trade. Now, whether, you know, it's usually the item went from place to place to place rather than the person, but yes, absolutely. Are there any known uh, effigy mounds there, like the, the serpent mound in Ohio? Is uh, where the mounds actually have a shape or a glyph. Right, right. It's, it, no. More so for just not for any kind of functional purpose, but because that wound visited the serpent mound in Ohio and it was just strictly an apogee. That's archaic woodland. They are about 900 A.D. Well, what, the, what the real revolution was, was around 700 A.D., you wind up with uh, corn. Finally makes it across the Sonoran Desert from Mexico. It's first raised about 5,000 years ago in, in the Central Valley of Mexico. But when corn makes it, and Michigan's about the last place you can grow corn, Michigan and southern Ontario, um, it's an extremely efficient crop, and it gives the Indians enough, it's, it's an agricultural revolution, it gives the Indians enough nutrition uh, uh, that uh, can be grown very efficiently that they have time to do things like build mounds in the shapes of serpents or just piles of, of dirt. But some of these mounds, uh, like I said, are you know, uh, 11 stories high. So these are not small uh, art of, um, buildings. I argue that the Natchez were just getting started when the French arrived, that they're, they come from a place called Emerald Mound, which is the largest site. And that's only a few miles away. Then we're talking about 15 miles. Um, so again, they break up, they reform, they break up, they reform. Um, and you know, one village might start in one polity, move to another. So you have this continuous flow of people. Not too different than us, where we pick up. I was born in New Jersey. I, I was born, you could see the uh, Statue of Liberty from where I was born. I used to talk like Joe Pesci. So, uh, you know, I, I lost that accent to some extent, and unless my students tell me when I say the word huge. Um, I, so, they, can, they know I'm from the area, because things are huge. So, uh, other questions? Gentlemen there. Given the, uh, well, the 36 year, Civil War in Guatemala, mm -hmm. between the Maya and the Hispanics, and the um, well, there's a group in Honduras also it's out of the, uh, losing the name right now, and I, I'm just wondering if there's any uh, way in, in which uh, this study can help explain some of these events that have occurred in other parts of the world. Um, I, I know the, the difference, the, 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 the Guatemalan Civil War, for example, um, I think they somehow got over it, but I don't know uh, exactly. What, what year are you talking about? Because there are a lot of wars in Guatemala. Yeah, well, the, that Civil War ended in, uh, in the 1980s. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, it was relatively recent, but it, it was going on for like 36 oh, years. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. The Hikakis in, in Honduras, I believe, are still isolated on a, on a mountaintop. Mm -hmm. They have their own language, it is not written. Chiapas is the same way in Mexico. Um, yeah, I'll give you an example. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was teaching in Oklahoma. I was still a grad student. And I taught a course on warfare in early America. And I spent some time talking about, needless to say, something I, I know a little bit about. So I'm talking about the Natchez. And on either side of the room, there were four Marines who were taking my course uh, uh, because it counted towards their ROTC degree. They were, going, they were all um, E6s, E7s. I think there was one E8, a drill instructor. He had no sense of humor, but they were all studying to get their, their bachelor's so they could become officers. On the other side were all army guys. So needless to say, I played them off against each other, made jokes about marksmanship and whatnot. Uh, the Marines loved it. Um, but at one point, we started talking, and I said, well, these are, 
uh, cultures that are more interested in keeping the family, the clan, and uh, the village together, they don't have allegiance to larger concepts like um, nation states. And all of a sudden, one of the Marines starts shaking his head. And says, this is just like Afghanistan. It's just like Iraq. And uh, today, to get uh, promoted from captain to major, you have to have a master's. Now, some of these gentlemen and women will get masters in history. But um, I think we're going to still have problems until they start getting degrees in anthropology. And start, I asked the Marines, I said, how many of you can speak Arabic? They said, not a one of us. Then I said, how many of your officers could speak Arabic? Not a single one. One of them said, we're totally dependent on interpreters. Some of the French finally learned to speak Nache, and that's why Le Pas de Prat learned to speak Nache. And, uh, he is our best informant. And uh, of course, there was one other informant, a, a Lieutenant uh, de Mont Montigny, and uh, this guy was a bit of a nebbish. He, he always managed, he couldn't help but fail to fail. I mean, he never failed to fail. Um, and he claimed to speak Nache too. But it was the women who learned French that we get most of our, the Natchez women who learned French, and the French women who learn Nache, because they're the ones who were talking all the time. So it's the tough mothers that held it together until the very end. I think we're, DJ, we're out of time. Um, do, I got one or two more questions. Do you mind? Can we, do, or do we, are you going to kick us out? Okay, go ahead. Where, um, where, did, the, the, where did the Soto find mouse? Oh, all through. Once he got into northern Florida, all through northern Florida, as far as Oklahoma. Yeah. And when he was, he didn't make it to Oklahoma. His, his uh, Muscasco, I believe was the name of his, his subordinate. Just as they were about to turn east, because the, the, there was none of these magical cities that they kept hearing about, because every, every, every chiefdom they went to, they said, do you have any gold? Oh, we don't have any gold, but those guys down the road, they have gold. So they get to about where Oklahoma, Arkansas border is, and they pick up this woman who was coming from the West. And this was an Indian woman who had been enslaved by Coronado in the, um, in the uh, West, in the far West, during Coronado's entrada. So could you imagine this poor woman being snatched from God knows where and now she's going to get dragged back to the Mississippi River. So you have this em enormous, one, one historian, uh, Robbie Etheridge, she calls it a shattered zone, where there's just this, this waves of violence going through because of the introduction of European weapons, European disease, and so on and so forth. Um, one more question, and then I think DJ's going to throw us out. It brings to mind uh, how Esperanto Came started as a universal yeah. language, uh, what was then the uh, part of the Russian Empire, or Eastern Poland today. But uh, we felt for many that uh, if you didn't speak the right language, uh, somebody would spit in your eye. And that, in fact, even was required in some American high schools until like 1960. Yeah. And yeah. of course, it ultimately went away. I remember that. And uh, of course, there's a, a language that's going to be easy to learn. It would be everyone's favorite second language. <laughs> and uh, it, would, it would promote world peace. That was the whole idea behind it. I remember it. Yeah, I was just a pup. But they had, they had a, mo a Mobilian trade jargon, which was a mixture of Muscogean or Creek, French, Spanish, and you know a few English words thrown in. So the men could talk to each other in this sort of pidgin language, but it was the women who were the real experts on culture. So I, I'm gonna have to wrap it up. I'll be around for a few minutes. I have my book if you, if you care to, to buy it. I, I, I'll, uh, it's uh, $26, but I'll let them go for a, a bit less. So. Um, as I wish my students were as, uh, as engaged, uh, sometimes they, I, they, for the amount of people who ask questions, uh, divided by the amount of people here, you guys did really well. Thank you very much.